Hello, Trinity Tigers and friends of the university. Welcome to the third virtual Food for Thought lecture. This event is part of lifelong learning initiatives presented by Trinity University Alumni Relations and Development and Special Events. My name is Amukla Karla, and tonight I will serve as your moderator. I graduated from Trinity University in 2020 as a neuroscience major and chemistry minor. And while I was at Trinity, I was an undergraduate neurobiology research assistant for our speaker tonight, Dr. Gerard Bodwin. I am currently a first year student at McGovern Medical School at UT Health in Houston. And I'm super excited to be able to take part in this event. I look forward to a great food for thought. For those of you watching this webinar, Dr. Bodwin welcomes questions throughout his lecture. So feel free to submit your thoughts and questions during the webinar using the Q&A tab. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker and my former professor, Gerard Bodwin III. Gerard Bodwin originally grew up in New Hampshire and Florida and came to Texas to attend Trinity University due to its commitment to undergraduate research. He graduated from Trinity Cum Laude with a BS in bi biochemistry um, as a member of the class of 99 and earned a PhD in neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He then completed two postdoctorates, the first at the University of California, San Francisco, studying the creation of synapses or the connections between neurons in mice using targeted mutations. And in his second postdoctorate, he worked at the University of Texas at San Antonio, studying the effects of cocaine on selected inputs to dopamine neurons in mice using a process called optogenetics. Now a professor at Trinity University guiding the development of undergraduate research scientists, Dr. Bodoin is studying the effects of cocaine on synapses in mice, hoping to block changes that underlie drug addiction. He recently was awarded the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation NARSAD Young Investigator Award to fund his research. Dr. Bodoin, thank you so much for presenting tonight for the Food for, Food for Thought series 2020-2021. Welcome and take it away. Thank you, Amin, for a very generous introduction. It's very excited to be here to tell you about uh, some of the mo most recent developments in creation of vaccine. Um, so let's get started. Today, the, I know that this said uh, biomedical and technological advances uh, to combat disease. Um, essentially, what we're going to be talking about tonight is uh, a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, which is the vac uh, the disease that actually causes uh, COVID, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19. As many of you are aware, the pandemic is currently raging across the United States. Um, and as of now, uh, there's been over 240,000 American deaths in the United States. So one of the things I'd like to do is take a um, 10 second pause uh, for us to put in our prayers and our thoughts um, those individuals that have already passed away, and, and hopefully we can uh, stem the tide. Thank you very much. And so, uh, you know, ultimately, what we're hoping to talk about tonight, um, as an outline, is what are our hopes in um, in actually creating a vaccine to combat COVID nineteen. Um, and it prevent us from getting infections from this virus, SARS-CoV-2. So we're gonna start by talking about who are the front runners. Um, let me see if I can grab a pointer. So who are the, whoops. There go. Who are the front runners? Um, and then we're gonna take a step back to start talking about sort of the beginning phases and central dogma of life. So we can understand you know, the ways in which uh, we're using molecular biology and biology to combat this uh, virus. Uh, then we'll talk about what is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and ultimately, then we're gonna talk about how does a vaccine actually work? Um, and then we're gonna end then with how were these vaccines made so quickly? You know, ultimately, what I hope you get away from uh, tonight is that you understand uh, you know, how do viruses actually work? How are we actually going about creating these vaccines so quickly? Um, and you know, ultimately, what we're hoping to look forward to uh, is that you know, we have a very efficacious vaccine that will hopefully you know, allow us to resume normal life. 
So bringing a vaccine to market, um, there's sort of several phases that are required for this. Uh, the first of which is the design and preclinical pre testing. This is the part that we're actually going to talk about tonight. This is the part that we actually hope to compress as much as possible um, to allow for the other phases to take place. Um, for any sort of drug that gets brought to market to be used in people, there are sort of three phases of the clinical trial. There's phase one trials, which involves limited numbers of individuals, a phase two trial, which has increased numbers of individuals sort of in the hundreds to thousands, um, and then finally the phase three trial, which has quite large numbers, so thousands to tens of thousands. It's important to understand that this first phase, design and preclinical testing, is gonna be done um, in the lab um, and potentially in animal models, but all these three phases here, phase one, two, and three, that's all done in people. That's the part that we need to go slowly on and that we need to be thorough on and that we have very good statistics to be sure that we are not gonna cause harm with the vaccine and that we in fact are gonna um, reduce the infectivity of, of the virus. So throughout this, all three trials are gonna be involved in looking at safety. Uh, the first phase, phase one trials, actually specifically will usually test dosage. Um, and then throughout all three phases, what they're gonna be looking for is an immune response. While they hope to actually be able to test whether or not it prevents infections, um, as a proxy to that, they can actually check for an immune response at both a, at a cellular level and a gene expression level. Now the phase three trial, what's critical about the phase three trial is this is when they do a, a blinded trial. It's actually called double blinded. And this is because they give people a placebo, which is a nonspecific injection um, that does nothing, um, as well as the vaccine. And what's important to understand about this is that it's double blinded, meaning that the patient doesn't know if they got placebo or vaccine, and the doctor, um, and as well as the company, doesn't know who got placebo and who got vaccine. This is really critical for the statistics, statistical analysis um, to prevent any um, user bias, you know, um, you know, company bias or doctor bias to somehow you know, massage the data to make it look better than it actually is. Um, ultimately, uh, what they're hoping to get from this is does the vaccine actually prevent infections? Um, throughout all three trials, as you increase the number of individuals, you're looking for rare side effects. Um, and we're actually going to talk later about some of the other issues um, that are actually um, some of the other issues that can actually be induced by a vaccine uh, that they're going to be looking for in these, in these individuals. So who are the, the front runners? Uh, as of right now, there are 12 vaccine front runners that are in phase three trials. This is an international effort. There are companies um, and uh, state run institutions uh, throughout Asia, Europe, and the Americas uh, that are working together on trying to bring a successful vaccine uh, to the masses. Um, for this, uh, there's some uh, American efforts from Moderna and NIH. Um, a conglomeration of European and American companies between BioNTech and, Ger and Germany, as well as Pfizer with Foson Pharma. Um, there's several efforts from China, including CanSinoBio. Um, there's also Sinopharm working with Wuhan Institute of Biological Products, as well as Sinopharm working with China National Pharmaceutical Group. There's the S Sinovac, another Chinese group. Um, there's Gamelia Research Institute, which is based in Russia. Uh, another American group is Johnson & Johnson working with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, an English group, AstraZeneca working with University of, of Oxford, uh, a group in India from Virat Biotech working with Indian Council of Medical Research, as well as the National Institute of Virology. Um, another American uh, company is Novavax, um, and then finally there's actually an Australian group, Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Um, and so, you know, this is a whole slew of different acronyms and different numbers of companies, um, some of which um, uh, there's a number of companies in um, a variety of different countries that are involved in this. You know, what are some of the modalities that they're using to actually treat and actually create a vaccine? And so rather than talk about each one of those individually, we're going to talk about sort of the five vaccine technologies um, that all of these companies fall into. And so there are two efforts using an RNA-based vaccine. This is uh, through Moderna, NIH, BioNTech, and Pfizer. There's four groups that are using inactivated coronavirus itself. So inactivated SARS-CoV-2. There's another four groups that are making virus-based vaccines. Uh, one group is a protein-based vaccine. This is Novavax, here, based here in the United States. 
Uh, and then the last group that we're actually probably not going to spend much time, that we're not going to spend much time on tonight, um, is this Murdoch's Children's Research Institute. They're testing whether a pre-approved vaccine that's already been used for a different virus is actually um, stemming infections of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so this is an idea that maybe uh, you can, um, that maybe there are some, uh, some crosstalk between the different types of viruses and that you may actually be able to find uh, one vaccine that actually help prevent from a different virus. I just see in the chat, there's um, someone actually asking if Eli Lilly's involved. There's some uh, recent data that came out today that actually there was, they got emergency use approval for uh, an antibody drug to treat people that are infected with, uh, with, vax, um, with the virus. Uh, they may have be involved in a vaccine as well for this, but they're not in phase three trials yet. And so I'm fo only focusing tonight on those that are actually in phase three trials. There are a number of companies. So there's, you know, these 12 groups that are in phase three. As you go to lower and lower uh, phases, there's a significant number of uh, companies that are um, in phase two or phase one, or even in preclinical, they're just about to hit phase one. So to step back and talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the way that uh, genes work and understand the molecular biology behind and the biology behind how viruses function, you know, I, I'm hoping to make this talk accessible to you know, those individuals um, who maybe don't have never been, taken a, bio, a biology class in, in college, right? So this is like, I'm hoping to make this accessible to everyone. So this is one reason why we're allowing for questions in the chat as I go through this. Um, it's important to understand, uh, you know, as we start from first principles, right? So that all life uses this scheme. This is called the central dogma. Uh, basically, you have our genes that are encoded in the DNA. Uh, this is a very stable molecule. It's the molecule that gets passed uh, from parents to offspring. Uh, this molecule then has to get moved into a working copy through a process called transcription, in which you now make RNA. This RNA then allows for conversion from the genetic information into a, a copy that actually does the work. And so this is through a process called translation in which we now make protein. So protein is the, the stuff that actually does most of the work of what we see. It gives us our traits. Uh, for instance, I have blue eyes and I have brown hair. That's all due to the proteins that get encoded in our, in our DNA. So let's talk a little bit more about DNA. DNA contains our genes safely. Um, it's actually two strands, uh, and that's one of the reasons why it's called a double helix. Um, what's important is that the outside of it, the backbone, actually doesn't contain the information. The information's on the inside where the, um, the bases are. And if we were to look at this at a much uh, higher magnification, what you would see is that there is actually only four different bases that are found in the inside of the DNA molecules. So this includes adenine, uh, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And so what you can actually see here is that the sequence on one strand actually is complementary to the sequence on the opposite strand. So this is really important for keeping our information safe. If there's a mutation or somehow one of these uh, nucleotides gets changed, then we know what it's supposed to be based upon the nucleotide on the other side. Um, and so A's pair with T's and C's pair with G's. And so if we have one strand of DNA, we immediately know what the other strand of DNA is going to be because of this pairing rule. So what are genes? Genes are sections of DNA that encode the information for ultimately building a protein. We do have changes in these genes, and this is our alleles, right? So not everyone has brown eyes, not everyone has um, you know, blonde hair, um, but, and you know, it's important to understand that our DNA doesn't only code for protein. The DNA also has repetitive elements that have been accrued over time. It also has um, the elements that are required for driving the next phase, driving transcription. Um, and then there's also a lot of buffer regions in there that sort of so that way, if we do get a mutation, hopefully it's in a region that doesn't code for protein. Now, RNA acts as the intermediary. It's, it's what allows it, our information that's stored in DNA, our genes, to now create proteins. Uh, the RNA molecule is also found to be complementary to the DNA during transcription. What typifies RNA, what makes it different from DNA, is that it has an alternate sugar. Uh, so you can actually identify which one is which. The cells can identify which one is which. 
Um, and then it also uses an alternate base. So it uses uh, uridine instead of thymine. And so these two mutations, uh, these two you know, differences between RNA and DNA um, means that you know, the sequences aren't exactly the same. Uh, but what's important here is that, um, right, so it's just U instead of T, but there's still a base pairing from U to A. So if we know what the DNA sequence is going to be through this base pairing, we know exactly what the RNA sequence is going to be. And so now how do we go from RNA to protein? This is a process that is called translation. Uh, translation um, essentially makes proteins of, uh, from a variety of substituents. And so there are 20 amino acids that we use. They all have different uh, chemical moieties on it, different chemical constituents on it. Um, they have different properties. And ultimately it's these properties of these amino acids that give our proteins the different functions that they do. Um, we would make a string of these amino acids and then these amino acids then would fold in on itself to create a characteristic three-dimensional shape um, to create a protein that now carries out a, a function. And so this is our genetic code here. And so this is how we go from nucleotides at the RNA level to amino acids at the protein level. Now we use three nucleotides uh, to create and specify a single amino acid. Now that's not to say that, uh, so one set of three nucleotides necessarily creates only one amino acid. However, we have, do have groups of nucleotides that can create the same amino acid, right? So um, there's only, there's 64 ways in which you can combine four nucleotides in three positions, uh, but we have 20 amino acids. Now some, very um, specific amino uh, codons, or these stretches of the nucleotides that are very important and that are slightly different are the start codon. This is what actually signals to the cell that this is now time to start creating protein from the RNA. This is AUG in the RNA sequence, which encodes for methionine as an amino acid. And then there's uh, three sets of three nucleotides that code for the stop. And now it's important to understand this, this is a universal genetic code. This is a genetic code that humans use, that fish, dogs use, the insects out in the, out in the, uh, out in the outside use, plants use, bacteria, uh, fungi, all of life uses this. We all follow these same rules of going from three nucleotides to an amino acid. And so this is really critical, right? If, if each, each organism had their own way of going from nucleotides to amino acids, we would not be where we are today. We would not understand how it is that one gene can create one protein because we'd have to refigure out this code for every organism. Um, and so what's important to understand is that viruses have to follow the same code as well. So ultimately, what I hope you understand from this is that DNA is this double helix, right? It's a double-stranded molecule in which uh, the two strands are complementary to each other uh, through these base pairing rules. And if you have this sequence of DNA, we then can create an RNA molecule. And then from that RNA molecule, we can actually incorporate amino acids and create proteins. And so the sequence of the DNA necessarily predicts what's gonna be the, the sequence of the protein at the end. Now let's talk a little bit about the cell biology of the central dogma. So cells at different shapes and sizes uh, in humans, uh, our cells all have nuclei. Um, and so our DNA is encoded in the nucleus. Uh, this is, keeps it all in one place, keeps it safe, and also keeps it segregated from the rest of the cell. Transcription, you know, the process of creating uh, messenger RNA actually takes place in the nucleus. Once the mature messenger RNA is created, it then will migrate into the cytoplasm, where now a ribosome, this is a, a large macromolecular structure composed of both RNA and proteins, now translate the messenger RNA into protein. And so this takes place out in the cytoplasm, uh, whereas the DNA is held in the nucleus. Now the holding all of this together is a plasma membrane. This is um, comp composed of lipids and phospholipids um, that help keep uh, the inside of the cell safe from the outside of the cell. And so this DNA, which is our sort of our information storage, uh, is en encased in the nucleus. Uh, it's translate, transcribed into messenger RNA, which is our information carrier. Um, and then ultimately in the cytoplasm, it's translated into proteins and sort of the active cell machinery. 
Okay, so from this, hopefully you understand so a little bit more about how you know our genes create proteins. Um, and it's important to understand that yes, while all you know all life follows this, viruses actually can survive outside of the scheme. Uh, it turns out that there are a number of viruses actually that don't have any DNA in them at all, um, and actually will live at the, at the RNA stage. Um, and so some of the rules are a little bit off and that the viruses actually will sort of skip some of these rules. They actually have proteins allow RNA to go backwards to DNA, which is like very unusual. Um, and so that's one of the things that makes viruses special and also one of the things that makes them unique. So let's look at a bunch of viruses. So these, uh, these are diseases caused by different kinds of viruses, uh, polio, chickenpox, hepatitis B, and COVID-19. Uh, these different viruses have different characteristics. Uh, polio virus actually has a, a capsule that's actually all made of protein, whereas these other three viruses that cause chickenpox or cause hepatitis B or cause COVID-19, they actually have a membrane very similar to our cells. Uh, some of them use RNA, some of them use DNA to carry their genetic information. Ultimately, these capsules their design is to keep the genetic information on the inside safe from the outside. So we identified a new disease back in December and already by January, we were able to figure out what was the sequence of nucleotides that make up all the genes of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This was determined in early January uh, and it was found that from the sequence that there were all RNA, there's 30,000 RNA molecules. To put this in perspective, you know, humans, we have 3 billion DNA uh, nucleotide letters that create our genome, create up all the genes that are in our, in our cells. Um, so this is a you know, relatively small number of nucleotides, um, but based upon looking at this sequence, we already could tell what are the proteins that this sequence makes. It creates a variety of non-structural proteins. It also creates a variety of structural proteins. And so what do these all, all these proteins do? So these genes, uh, they help make more RNA. They help slow down detection and actually will modify the cell so that way it can evade detection. Uh, it all, they also help create the envelope, create the, the proteins that are required uh, for fusing with the cell, the next cell it wants to infect. Um, and then ultimately, they also contain some proteins that allow it to coat and protect the RNA genome. So we're gonna take a little pause here. We're gonna watch a video, uh, sort of a minute and a half video talking about um, sort of the basics of, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. In December, 2019, China notified the World Health Organization of several cases of human respiratory illness, a disease later named COVID-19 the virus causing this disease is known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The disease spreads through small droplets that are expelled from the nose or mouth when a person with COVID-19 coughs or exhales. Therefore, standing close to someone who is infected can put you at risk. These droplets can land on your hand and be transmitted through something as simple as a handshake. If afterwards you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, the so-called T-zone. The virus is known to survive on different types of surfaces, so touching these contaminated surfaces and then touching your T-zone brings a high risk of infection. What we know so far, the coronavirus is spherical in shape and its genetic material is encapsulated by different types of proteins. Some of the key structural ones are Spike S protein, the most prominent feature of coronaviruses from where they get their name, then M or membrane protein, and the so-called envelope protein. That's great. Hopefully, you know, some of this should be review, right? The idea that we should wash our hands, uh, we're wearing masks now to help uh, prevent the spread of a virus from your, uh, your mouth for, uh, to others. Um, and so once we knew the sequence and we knew it was a coronavirus, this allowed us to you know, tap into the wealth of knowledge we knew from other coronaviruses. 
And so we actually have lots of exposure to coronaviruses, not just these ones that cause you know, significant harm. Uh, several common colds are actually caused by coronaviruses. This includes OC43, 229E, HKU1, as well as NL63. These are what we call endemic, meaning that you know, we're, they're commonly, um, we're commonly uh, can catch these viruses um, and you know, generally we're relatively harmless. The two other coronaviruses that have hit the news more recently in the last 20 years would be the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS-CoV, as well as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS-CoV. So MERS came into play in the last 10 years and the world's SARS uh, it was originally discovered in 2003. So what are the structural proteins of SARS-CoV-2? And so we saw a little bit on that video, uh, there's the spike glycoprotein, there's the M protein, this HE or hemagglutin esterase dimer, um, and then the envelope is actually a plasma membrane. Um, and then the RNA and N protein, the N protein is this nucleocapsid protein that helps protect the RNA on the inside of the, of the virus. Um, and then the last external uh, protein is the E protein. Now, of all of these proteins on the outside of the virus, the one that's like the most key is the spike protein. And so the spike protein actually has a very small part of it. It's called a domain. Uh, and there's what's called a receptor binding domain. Based upon the, the RNA sequence, which would create the protein sequence, we were able to analyze the protein sequence of the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 versus the SARS-CoV and the MERS-CoV viruses. And in fact, what you can see here is that there's a great deal of overlap between the SARS-CoV-2 and the SARS-CoV viruses, and actually much less overlap with the MERS-CoV virus. So much so that if they were to use, like express these as proteins, and then antibodies which can detect the protein, what they find is that antibodies that can detect the SARS-CoV uh, receptor binding domain can also bind to the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. However, uh, although there's some limited sequence homology, you know, amino acids that line up between the SARS-CoV-2 and MERS-CoV, uh, the antibodies that can detect the MERS-CoV coronavirus actually cannot cross-react with SARS or SARS-CoV-2. So this really suggested that SARS-CoV-2 was very similar to the SARS-CoV uh, virus. And so that gave us a hint as to what the spike proteins are doing. Spike proteins are the ones that actually mediate the first interaction with a cell that it wants to infect. And what's known is that these uh, spike proteins interact with ACE2. This is angiotensin converting enzyme two. Uh, in the case of the coronavirus, it binds to ACE2, which then allows it to be enveloped. And then its uh, nucleotide information gets transmitted inside the cell. What's important about this receptor is where it's localized. So this receptor is heavily localized in the deep airways of the lungs, as well as the nasal passages. Uh, what's really important about the function of this receptor is it converts angiotensin 2 or angiotensin 1 uh, into angiotensin 1-9 or 1-7. These molecules, angiotensin 2, is um, a molecule that gets secreted during infections uh, and can actually lead to acute lung injury, as well as changes in, in the circulatory system. Um, so some general inflammation, uh, it can be really bad uh, if the angiotensin can't be converted into angiotensin 1-7 you know, by this enzyme. And it turns out that this enzyme that would actually be protective is also the same enzyme that mediates its, the virus entry into our cells. So, Let's talk about how our immune system can pr prote uh, protect us from viruses. And so we're gonna talk about you know, two phases of the immune system, the second line of defense and the third line of defense. Um, what's important is to understand that what's the first line of defense. The first line of defense is actually our unbroken skin and our mucus. And so this is uh, just preventing entry of the virus to hit cells. Um, so our skin is made up of uh, dead, dead skin cells and so a, you know, as long as our skin remains unbroken, that prevents entry directly into our uh, circulatory system. Similarly, the mucus can help slow down viruses and potentially help uh, prevent viruses ever reaching a cell. We help help the way um, help our mucus by you know keeping distant from other people as well as wearing masks, you know preventing spread of the of the virus to other people. 
Now, the, the first line of defense um, doesn't require any memory. It doesn't require any first um, encounters with the virus. It uses cells to identify foreign particles. These get enveloped and then ultimately digested and, and, and killed. And so, and to help with this, we have other cells like dendritic cells and mast cells that help recruit these neutrophils into regions to help, you know, when we find things like um, bacteria or viruses that are in the, not in the right place that don't belong there, we can sort of recruit this and you know degrade these functions, uh, degrade this um, these foreign par particles. But we also have an adaptive immune system, and so this involves two major types of cells: the B cells and the T cells, as well as our antibodies. When we're born, we actually have a whole slew of B cells and T cells that have a whole slew of different and encode for different kinds of antibodies um, that we know don't bind to ourselves um, and that are sort of ready and waiting for like the next time we either get exposed to a virus or some other um, protein that doesn't belong in inside our body. But they're sort of in a quiescent state. And so this inactive B cell has to be um, exposed to viruses or other proteins to activate them. Um, once this antigen binds to antibodies um, as well as class two MHC molecules on these B cells, they interact with T cells. They, this sensitized B cell will interact with what's called a helper T cell, which will release a variety of proteins from that T cell to activate the B cell. They do a variety of functions, one of which is it tells some of the B cells to remain inactive and actually form a memory, um, and other cells will, will be activated. Um, and this activated B cell will now start to create and become a little antibody production factory. And so when you get infected, um, if, we, if the right kinds of B cells can be found and activated by the T cells, you mount this antibody response to help identify these proteins and identify viruses for targeting for degradation and, and clearance uh, from uh, your, your body. And hopefully some of these antibodies will actually prevent infection um, and other, other antibodies will hopefully, you know, um, can potentially even protect against some of the other functions that these viruses do. What's the purpose of a vaccine? So the purpose of the vaccine is to tap into this adaptive immune system and sort of train your immune system so it's sort of ready for when a full-blown uh, virus and viral invasion takes place. And so this is an example shown for the HPV vaccine, which is a more, one of the more recent vaccines that have been created. Um, there are several shots that are given for this. So this would be the first shot, the second shot, and then finally the third shot. And so it's only on the what's called you know, the prime in, uh, injection, and then after two boosts with more of the vaccine, do you now create enough antibodies that ma are maintained in your, um, in your blood to help protect against this, this virus if you were to get exposed to it? And so the hope is that the vaccine will help um, activate the adaptive immune system and help select for the right B cells that will create the right kinds of antibodies that will allow us to identify and prevent infections from the new from invading viruses. Okay, so to step back again to the timeline, so everyone's on the same page. Sure. So the disease, COVID-19, that was identified in late December 2019 in Wuhan, China. Although it was, there's some indications it's actually clear it was already in Europe at this point. Um, and then from this disease, they identified the virus and they sequenced it. Um, and so the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was known by January 10th, 2020. Based upon the sequence homology, they were able to identify that not only is it a coronavirus, but it's highly related to SARS-CoV-1, the original one. Um, and based on it being a coronavirus and its relation to SARS, we knew the spike protein was going to be important for infection. There had been uh, vaccine efforts for SARS as well as for MERS. Unfortunately, they've never completed phase three trials because we've gotten those infections under control uh, before, um, before we could actually finish testing those vaccines. Now, all along in the last 20 years, um, this is a review done by Anthony Fauci actually in 2018. There's been shrinking amounts of time in that sort of that preclinical stage, the design and preclinical stage. 
uh, in 2003, the SARS coronavirus vaccine was sort of ready to try in phase one trials in 20 months. Um, in 2006, influenza A, which uh, was the bird flu, uh, with H5, um, was ready in 11 months. The swine flu influenza A in 2009 with H1 was actually ready in four months. Um, and then finally in Zika virus, when Zika was raging through uh, South America and other, other places, uh, we started creating a virus, a vaccine to that. We had a vaccine sort of ready for phase one trials in three and a quarter months. So this is all using a DNA-based vaccine, um, which actually are none of the front runners at the moment. Um, but it's important to understand that, that we were in developing the technology to create vaccines in a very quick way. Um, and our timeline had been compressing in, um, over the past 20 years. And so one of, the, one of the key technologies that allowed us to bring that vaccine, um, to create that vaccine so quickly is gene synthesis. So based upon the sequence that was released in January 10th, um, normally when people release a new sequence, you have to wait for that sequence to be delivered to you from you know, the original source. So someone who isolated a, vi a virus, they would find ways of moving it into uh, a vector that would allow them to uh, grow lots of this, uh, more of this, uh, copies of this that they then could ship to other people. That takes a lot of time. Nowadays, we do this all through synth synthetically. So we can take the sequence, we can send that sequence to a company, and then they can synthesize it and give it to us. So although it was, the virus was identified in China, you could be in the United States, read off that sequence, um, and actually send it to a company. For instance, um, one of those actually is GenScript, located in the United States. You could give them the sequence within two weeks. You could be getting that sequence so you can start doing experiments on it um, and testing things. There had been a lot of work on how the spike protein worked um, and how the spike protein mediated cell entry. And so this is actually work done in 2017 on the MERS spike, vir uh, spike protein. Uh, you can see here that you know, on the virus, the head looks sort of globular, um, you know, kind of like a golf tee maybe. And then once it's interacted with its uh, uh, protein, its um, receptor found on the host cells, in this case, it's called DPP4, this head domain starts to open up and actually it will fall off and reveal and create this very long extended structure that this is a trimer of proteins. So three proteins like interwound that actually will span from the plasma membrane of the cell to the plasma membrane of the virus. Um, that allows ultimately for opening up and merging of those two membranes to allow for injecting of the RNA uh, nucleotides into the host cell. So we're actually um, going to watch a video where someone actually created a three-dimensional uh, animation of how the protein actually can mediate membrane fusion. There's no audio for this, so I'm just going to explain it. You can see here that this is the spike protein as it starts. It has two domains, the S1 domain and the S2 domain. The S1 domain is important for binding to the ACE2 receptor. This reveals the S2 domain, which now gets this very elongated structure. It in inserts itself into the plasma membrane of the cell, the host cell. And then very quickly, these two S2 domains um, will change the conformation and bring these membranes close enough that they merge, allowing for injection of the RNA nucleotides. So what's critical about this is really understanding how the structure works. Um, it turns out that the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 actually works very similar to MERS uh, and SARS-CoV-1. And so based on this, um, what they found uh, in working on MERS and SARS-CoV uh, spike proteins, there's some important elements in this spike protein. So shown here on the right, this is the, the end of it that would be actually in the viral membrane. Uh, this right here, S1, S2, is where there's actually a break in the protein. So this would normally be one long protein, and then there's an enzyme, a protein, that actually will cleave the two domains, S1 and S2. Um, 
And it's this S2 domain, the one on the right, that actually ultimately will get that very elongated structure to you know, allow for movement of the two membranes close enough that they fuse. Well, what this group found uh, in 2017 was if they included two new amino acids at this little spot here, this region of S2, they could actually lock S2 and prevent it from getting that elongated structure. This actually had two major, um, this actually had two proper, uh, two changes in how the protein functions. So the first one is that it significantly increased expression of the protein in um, cells. So the MERS with this two, two proline mutation, two P mutation, there was a significantly more of the protein being created. Uh, and same thing for the SARS spike protein with that two P mutation, you had significantly more of that protein being created in cells. The next thing that they found was that they could, could in fact lock that protein in that closed like sort of uh, golf tee shape. And so shown here in red, these are the protein structures of MERS with, without that mutation. And so some of the proteins that I isolated had this nice elongated structure as they would if they were trying to start to merge the two plasma membranes together. Whereas if they inserted these two proline mutations, they could actually hold that conformation in that sort of pre-fusion state. So before the, uh, the protein's been um, binds to the receptor on the host cell and before it can actually start merging the two, uh, merging the two membranes together and inject the RNA uh, genome into the host cell. It also worked for SARS-CoV-1. And so this also, in the wild type case, you can see that you, some, you had some of the population of these proteins that have this very elongated structure, Whereas in the case of the two proline mutation, they were able to lock it together so that way it prevented, you know, hitting the getting to the confirmation that would allow it for you know, fusion of membranes. So we sort of understand how the spike protein works. We understand that its receptor is going to be ACE2. We know if we can block ACE2, uh, ACE2 from binding to the spike protein with antibodies that neutralize the spike protein, that then we can prevent infections. And so how do we deliver these proteins? We deliver the viral proteins either as protein or as an inactivated virus. These are two strategies that are used for delivering the protein directly. Um, or we can actually just deliver the viral sequence to cells in our body and have our cells create the proteins themselves. And so there's actually two methods that are currently being used and being looked at in phase three trials. One is an RNA uh, vaccine that actually just delivers RNA. And then the other one is an adenovirus, which actually delivers DNA. Now it's important to remember, right? So this RNA vaccine, it only has to enter into the cytoplasm, whereas the adenovirus, uh, one of the reasons we're using a virus to deliver you know, another viral protein is because the virus is very good at getting its genetic information into the nucleus. So the inactivated virus approach is being used by four different companies. Um, they've essentially created the entire coronavirus and then they used um, a variety of chemicals to inactivate that full-length virus. They have to co-administer it with um, what's called an adjuvant. This is something that you inject along with uh, this inactivated virus to sort of ramp up your immune system. And so this sort of um, irritates the immune system and gets it starting to look for things that are causing this irritation. Unfortunately, they're all using this sort of um, sort of an, an older but you know well-approved uh, adjuvant called alum or alum, aluminum salts based um, co uh, um, adjuvant, which would get co-administered with their inactivated virus. There's some indications that this may increase the side effects of the vaccine. Um, and you know, there may still be difficulty in producing the full length virus. Although you know, these four companies are all in phase three trials. So you know, they have you know, overcome those difficulties. Another approach is being used to delivery of protein nanoparticles. And so Novavax, what it's doing is it's actually creating the protein directly. They're using insect cells. It's a moth cell type called SF9. What's really interesting about these cells is they grow in suspension. So normally cells have to grow flat adhering to plastic or adhering to glass. These can grow in a large vessel. Um, and as long as they're shaken, they get enough oxygen, uh, they will continue dividing. So they grow very high cell densities um, ultimately, you can get a lot of protein from these cells. Um, the way they deliver the spike protein information, the gene, um, is using an insect virus. Um, 
Importantly, they've optimized these cells for, for expression. They have actually made some mutations to the spike protein. They've actually blocked that cleavage site, the one that separates S1 and S2. And then they also introduced this double proline mutation. So this is the proline mutation that helps lock that conformation of the spike protein in sort of that pre-fusion state. Um, ultimately, what they hope, what they have um, isolated is a trimer of these proteins. And so they purify this, they inject it, and they actually use a very novel adjuvant that um, is, is approved, um, uh, but is thought to have less side effects than the alum adjuvant. Now, the other two ways, which is, you know, in, injecting a vaccine, you know, delivering a vaccine that makes our cells now create uh, the proteins, uh, one way is the delivery of RNA with lipids. Uh, these two versions of this, one by Moderna and NIH, uh, and the other by BioNTech Pfizer with Boson Pharma. Uh, they're both using this two proline spike mutation. Um, they're both using modified RNA ba bases to prevent degradation. However, the Pfizer vaccine actually is using this S1, S2 cleavage site um, mutation, whereas from my understanding, it doesn't seem that Moderna is using that mutation. Now, how are they delivering these RNA molecules? And so they're actually using a, a fairly old technology that's been around for the last few decades, that's been worked on and optimized for you know, delivery into humans, um, but has been used in the lab you know, significantly over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And so this is using lipids sort of to create um, and, and encapsulate uh, the RNA molecules to then deliver it into cells. And so I've actually used this technique, it's called transfections, uh, which we use lipid molecules to actually deliver DNA, uh, deliver genes encoded on DNA. And so this is a case here of a cell, the new neuron grown in culture that's now expressing a green fluorescent protein. And in another case, we were actually delivered a, the sequence for a transcription factor called hairless, which now is you know, found expressed in the nucleus. So Dr. Bodwin, we actually have a question here. Um, yep. Larry Crane asks, why does the SARS-CoV-2 virus attack the vascular and nervous systems in addition to the respiratory system? This seems to be a major differentiator from other coronaviruses. Does it involve a different cytokine response? Um, well, so I think, the, I think the real issue is that probably, um, so ACE2 is found in all of these different, in all of these different locations. Um, and so the SARS virus, the original SARS virus probably also was um, infecting those same types of cells. Um, there may have been some differences in some of the other uh, capsule proteins that maybe are some, or envelope proteins that maybe are somehow allowing it to gain access to um, more cells that have ACE2. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, in terms of how SARS worked, that disease sort of ran its course and we, you know, there's not really many infections of that anymore. And so it, not a lot has, was, was studied on and exactly what it was causing. And so some of the things that have made SARS-CoV-2 so much worse though, is its ability um, to infect way more people. Um, and, and right, the SARS infection, if you got it, was actually you know, relatively really bad. Right, the, it, the the fatality rate for SARS, the original SARS, was close to thirty percent, and so it was definitely something you did not want to get. Fortunately, it did not transmit through the air very quick, very easily, and so as long as you you know used personal protective equipment um, and kept your distance, they were they were able to bring those that um, that uh, viral and, and, and epidemic under control relatively quickly. Um, yeah, so the two, I saw there's a new, there's a new question here about the S1, S2 cleavage site and the two proline mutations. So those two proline, that double proline mutation, that is what helps lock that spike protein into the conformation that it looks like kind of like a golf tee. And so it prevents it from getting that elongated conformation um, that is, a, is what's required for a fusion, right? So we want to block we want antibodies that neutralize it before it even gets to that elongated conformation. We want to prevent it from even binding to ACE2. And so for that, we want to essentially maintain it as that sort of globular protein. Um, and what another mutation that's been found to be you know, helping with that is blocking the, the protease site that separates S1 from S2. And so if you can essentially block uh, the cleavage of S1 from S2, that also helps maintain the protein in that sort of globular 
formation format, um, which would help create antibodies that target you know, the ACE2 binding. Those are great questions, thank you. Um, the last method of delivery is through, um, yeah, so we'll get to those in a second. Uh, so the last, last method of delivery of the gene is by a virus. And so adenovirus is a double-stranded DNA virus. It does not integrate into the genome, so it will not cause cancers. Um, and it's non-enveloped, which means it's um, you know, relatively stable. Um, what, this has been a format that's been used and been trying to be optimized as a vaccine format uh, using what's called different serotypes. So the proteins on the outside that mediate infection, um, adenovirus type 5, adenovirus tw type 26, and then also a chimpanzee adenovirus. This stands for chimpanzee adenovirus Oxford 1. And so this was isolated by a, a lab at University of Oxford. Um, but essentially, what we're trying to do is create an adenovirus that will both infect us that um, will evade our immune system, but allow us to express uh, the spike protein. And so unfortunately, adenovirus 5 is very commonly used, is actually is fairly common uh, as a co common cold. And so a number of us may have already been exposed to adenovirus 5. Um, and so we may actually have antibodies that directly bind to the vaccine, preventing any infection and preventing any expression of proteins. Um, and so we don't actually raise an immune reaction to the spike protein. Um, and so that's why they're using these novel adenoviruses, adenovirus 26 and the chimpanzee adenovirus. Now, in terms of the why we're using viruses, we've gotten very good at creating viruses in culture um, using human cells. And so this virus production essentially requires moving the adenovirus information into a cell that we then can grow lots of. Uh, we can use human-based cells. Uh, there's no unknown ingredients that could potentially um, cause an immune reaction in us. Uh, they're, again, grown in suspension at very high cell density, um, and they actually can block the expression of the spike protein during the production of the virus phase here. What's important is that these viruses will not replicate when they in infect us. So they will in infect a few cells, um, they will, those cells will create spike protein, and then that will be it. It's not going to then start creating more viruses uh, and then go all over our whole body. Um, now, the last thing to understand in terms of there's some information here about one of these that published recently by in Nature by Johnson & Johnson's. They're using this adenovirus serotype 26. They've actually shown that with a single shot, you can get proteins that neutralize the, neutralize the virus. And so um, they actually tried a number of different proteins for the one that they wanted to create for the vaccine. So they actually made some changes at the beginning of the sequence. They've also tested this double proline mutation, as well as the mutation that blocks that S1, S2 cleavage. And it turns out that the best one that worked that blocks both the S1, S2 cleavage and the double proline. And so this is a log plot, which means that, you know, as you go from one tick mark to the next, it goes up by tenfold. And so the one that made the most neutralizing antibodies was this one that both blocked the cleavage and blocked, had the double proline mutation. Uh, and so this is the one that they're using in their drug, their phase three trial right now. So uh, ultimately the phase three concerns that we're looking for is that the, the vaccine is effective. They're looking for a protection level greater than 50%. Um, and they're looking for two syndromes that potentially could be induced by the vaccine. One is uh, the antibody dependent enhancement, which um, causes an increased incidence of infection. So this is, this is really bad, right? This is essentially you take the vaccine and now you're more likely to get, the, get infected. Um, and so th this has been a common problem with dengue virus and dengue virus types. Um, and then another issue that has come up more recent that we've been studying is this vaccine associated enhanced respiratory disease in which the vaccine actually sensitizes the individual for additional respiratory complications. This was discovered both for the measles as well as for their um, a respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, in the, early, in the late, I said early 1960s, but in the 1960s. And so, um, in fact, it's these two phenomena that's really sort of slowed down vaccine development because they're very careful to look for these uh, concerns, both in phase two and phase three. Um, and in many cases, uh, vaccine trials fail because of these two reasons. So hopefully everyone saw the news uh, this past Monday. It turns out that the vaccine by Pfizer, they actually took an interim look at their data. So they're hoping what they've done is they've infected, uh, administered 
to 40,000 individuals. So 20,000 of them have received the placebo, 20,000 of them have received the vaccine. And what they're waiting for is they're waiting for 140 instances of coronavirus infections in these people. At that point, they will stop the study. They will then look to see if there are any side effects. Um, and they will look to see of those 120 or 140 people that were infected, how many of them were given the placebo and how many of them were given the vaccine. And so this interim look that they did, they actually were shooting to do it at the 30 infection stage, but NIH asked them to hold off to the 60 infection stage. When they had hit 60 infections, they went to NIH, said, okay, we've hit 60 infections. We're going to send our data to an outside review committee to see how the vaccine trial is running. And they said, and by the time they got the approval from NIH, unfortunately, our case counts in the United States have, have skyrocketed. So by the time they went, they asked for approval at the 60 person stage, they already had over 90 infections. And what's important to understand is that this outside review committee is separate from the company, separate from the doctors, separate from the, the patients. So nobody knows who got which. The only people that know is this very small scientific board. And what they found was that in fact, it was 90% effective, which basically means out of those 90 individuals, probably nine of them were given the vaccine and 80 of them were probably given the placebo. And so what we don't know yet is what, if what, um, how those nine individuals that got, that got the vaccine, how those individuals fared. Did they, you know, for instance, have less conversion having to go um, into the hospital um, and have less complications? And so that's something that's going to come out when they finally finish the phase three trial and we'll get all that information. But so we I know there's lots of questions. Um, just in conclusion, you know, vaccine must deliver the spike protein. They've discovered mutations that seem to make it, um, that seem to be uh, necessary for enhancing the immune response. Um, and that the reason they were, moved, were able to move so fast is because uh, they were able to create synthetic DNA. They were using already developed methods for creation of the vaccine. Uh, and then they were using animal models that could be used for testing. And so I know we've gotten some questions. Um, and so let's start taking them. Uh, Great, yeah, so we've got one from David Weichman um, who asks, this is more of a healthcare administration question, but how can the government and business leaders convince our fellow citizens to get immunized this coming year? Um, and he mentions that he heard on NPR that even 40% of nurses don't wanna take the COVID vaccine. So I think the issue here that we're talking about is um, people don't want to take a vaccine in, that has been given emergency use approval, right? They don't wanna be taking the vaccine that's just barely made it through phase one or phase two trials. They want to see that a vaccine is safe, and I get that, and I think that's really important. And so what's important about the development of the vaccine is that we shrink the amount of time it takes for the design and the creation of the vaccine, and that we you know, are very thorough in the phase one, phase two, phase three trials. And so my hope is that you know, we don't rush through phase three and we wait for the right benchmarks at phase three, um, in which we can actually you know, very confidently say that those, those companies that make it through phase three can say, this is the data of what we got. This is how effective it is. These are the types of complications we've seen. Um, and you know, essentially, yes, it's safe. Um, and I think that's what it's gonna come down to. I think you know, this emergency use approval, I think that's gonna be, um, that's probably gonna be the red flag that's probably gonna keep a lot of people from taking it. Uh, which vaccine would I choose for me and my family? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so honestly, I, I'm going to be waiting for those phase three trials to come out. If, uh, if they've completed phase three trial, they've checked for things like increased incidence of infection, they've checked for increased incidence of respiratory disease, um, and it's highly effective. That sounds pretty good to me. I mean, the, the one that's winning, right, the one that we heard information from on Monday, uh, that's an RNA vaccine. And so, um, and what's interesting about that vaccine is it's using some of the mutations that are being used by some of the other vaccine technologies. And so what we may find is that, in fact, many of these vaccines are going to become approved sort of around the same time with very similar results. Because, you know, in the case of the Novavax, they did the exact same protein, but they're injecting protein instead of injecting vaccine, a virus. Um, and, or, you know, RNA as a molecule, RNA protein, RNA um, complexes. And so we may see that, in fact, they both work just equally as well, which would be great. Um, that we, hopefully we can see that because another issue is going to be, we need 
to administer this to 8 billion people, uh, which means we need a lot of doses. And so it may mean that we're going to have to be producing many of these many different vaccines at the same time. So um, to combine two of the questions that are kind of similar um, with the Pfizer data, how did they account for test subjects who chose to quarantine versus not? And also, how did we account for people's exposure risk being similar? So I think the idea is, how, do, how are we making sure these results are, are valid? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so um, I think that to under, you know, one thing that to understand is that that the infection of individuals isn't the only benchmark that they're using for these. The other things they're checking out for as they're looking for the immune response that's being generated in these people. Are they creating antibodies that actually neutralize it or are they just creating non-specific non antibodies that actually don't prevent infections? Uh, they're also gonna be looking for the type of immune response. So it turns out that that, um, that respiratory disease that's vaccine induced, that actually, you can get some clue of whether or not you're going to get that kind of respiratory disease based upon the, the profile of cells in the immune system that get activated. And so they're also going to be checking that kind of information at the same time. And so uh, the other thing to understand is that you know, these are very large trials. They they're have you know, 20,000 people getting placebo, 20,000 people getting the vaccine. Uh, it may be that you know, by the time they hit 140 you know, cases, they may be well past that by the time they actually have to close the, the phase three trial. And so the other thing to understand is they will be, once they've sort of stopped, they've collected the data and they've hit that um, benchmark of the number of people, they're not going to stop monitoring those people. They're going to be checking them for the longer term, the next six, 12 months to be sure they're not having any like further complications um, that potentially are due to the vaccine. And so, you know, they're going to continue to know who's placebo, who's vaccine, um, and look for, you know, potential side effects that potentially develop even later. Right. Okay. So we have time for just one more question. And that question is, is there any connection between blood type and the immune system? In other words, are certain blood types more immune to COVID? Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. So there was some very early data, right? There was very early data from China that actually suggested uh, that actually there, there was a tie-in tie between um, the blood type and the, you know, the severity of the disease. Uh, that initial data was actually generated from individuals in China. And so um, there have been now multiple studies that have gone back that have expanded the pool of people that are in that study um, from people that are from you know, different countries now. So people from Europe, people from America, um, and so from around the world. And so when they started looking more broadly, um, they find that in fact the blood type itself doesn't actually predispose someone to having a more severe case of, of, the, uh, of infection. And so what that means in terms of um, that, that's great, right? It means that probably the, the blood type actually isn't what's required, but it may mean that there's something else on the genome that's like very closely tied to um, that blood type that's um, very on that same chromosome that maybe predisposes someone to a more, you know, more severe infection that, you know, in a more limited population led to this um, correlation that now when you expand it to much more people that you don't see that actually. Okay, well, thank you so much for a great presentation, Dr. Bodoin. I learned a lot and I'm sure the audience learned a lot as well. Um, so with that to the audience, thank you so much for your great questions. And um, I hope you all have enjoyed this webinar. For additional Learning Together content, including other webinars, please visit the Trinity University events page. Our next Food for Thought is scheduled for Wednesday, December 9th at 5.30 p.m. Central Time. We're in for a special treat just before the holidays. The discussion topic is From Bell Tower to Concert Hall, The Evolution of Handbells, presented by Trinity University professor Diane Perslin and alumnus Taylor Mobley. To conclude the presentation, the Trinity Handbell Ensemble will perform festive holiday music on over 200 bells. So with that, this completes tonight's lecture. Thank you all for being here tonight and go Tigers.